Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. This is your host, Colin Cattell, returning guest on the program today for our fourth edition of the Battery Metal series is Mike Beck. Mike, Happy New Year. Welcome back to the program. Thank you very much, Colin. Always happy to to speak with you. We have now successfully gone through the narrative for lithium, cobalt, and nickel, as well as your favorite ways to play those three. And we're talking now about your fourth commodity, which is copper. And copper certainly plays into the battery metal theme, but also has several other applications. So from a broad stroke perspective, why do you see copper performing strongly over the next year or two with the battery metals uh, wrapped in there? Yes. Yeah, so, so as you say, this is kind of the fourth installment, and and maybe the last uh, f- for for me in terms of the battery metals that I I follow. Um, just as maybe some background for your listeners, the the copper market, just to put things in perspective, is is massive, and it's by far the the most important of the base metals. Copper mines the by twenty three million tons per annum and um, that really dwarfs for example that of the next largest base metal nickel which has by comparison an annual mine production of of two tons per annum so you know just again in terms of size the copper market is 10 times um, larger than the size of the next um, most important base metal at least in terms of volume so it's um it's it's probably um not by coincidence we've kind of worked our way from um the smallest of the the metals now to the largest starting with the really the niche metals of of lithium and cobalt which are really tiny volumetrically to then stepping up to nickel and now to the to big copper as it's called um it's particularly uh, copper is particularly interesting, um, as with the other three metals, and it it um, electric vehicles really represent, a, a, a notwithstanding the massive size of the of the copper market, a new and important source of of incremental demand for copper, and um, it's. Pretty easy to do the numbers. The average electric vehicle requires um, 80 kilograms more copper than the equivalent internal combustion engine vehicle, and that's mostly because of the the copper requirements in the electric motor and the additional wiring that is required for an electric vehicle, as opposed to an internal combustion engine vehicle or ICE, as it's called in in the business. So you have 80 kilograms of really incremental copper per passenger vehicle. And in addition to that, there is significant um, additional copper outside the vehicle that will be required to build out the EV infrastructure. Um, For example, the the power uh, generation and grid infrastructure is all largely copper-based. There'll be requirements for Grid storage, which again represents additional demand for for copper, and then and then finally on the infrastructure side, the the actual charging infrastructure is is copper intensive. Um, so so how does this all shake out? Well, it's it's an interesting analysis. CRU, who are perhaps one of the most respected independent uh, metals consultancy, were retained by Glencore, a major copper producer and cobalt producer, I should add, um, late last year to undertake a detailed um, study and address the question of how much incremental copper demand can be expected from this new market of electric vehicles. And Glencore very kindly and probably somewhat self-servingly um, published the results of the CRU Commission study um, last month. And 
the, the bottom line conclusion was that electric vehicles and, and the associated infrastructure will generate an incremental 4 million tons per annum of demand by 2030. Now, uh, to put this in context, 4 million tons, this represents about 17% of, of world mine supply last year. And or volumetrically, just to compare it, for example, with nickel, um, the total nickel um, mine supply is 2 million tons a year. And so now we're talking about uh, electric vehicles requiring a further 4 million tons, so twice the entire size of the of the nickel market in terms of volume that's a lot of metal um, and where this incremental copper supply will originate is is anybody's guess uh, because growth is really growth in copper mine supply is already challenged by a combination of declining grades labor strife increased um, time for permitting and in 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 places um, like Chile which is responsible for about 30 percent of the world's copper supply um, severe water constraints so so this is kind of interesting um, particularly uh, with the backdrop of the last five years because the the industry the last five years has under invested in new copper supply, largely because the copper price uh, dropped off uh, dramatically um, in 2012 and, and stayed depressed until until um, mid-late last year when it started to tick back up. Uh, for your listeners, by the way, the current copper price is um, $7,200 a ton, which is up about 30% or so the last year. So the, the industry um, uh, has underinvested the last five years, and, and I would characterize the current state of the industry as facing a structural deficit. Um, the market was in deficit last year by small volumes and is expected to be in deficit again this year, and the deficits will only grow as EV penetration rates um, start to ramp up from where they are today, which is about 1% to the consensus view of 15 to 20% of passenger vehicle by um, 2030. Um, so what has to happen? Well, an industry is not going to invest in new uh, copper capacity uh, until they're incentivized to do so by a much higher copper price. So copper prices, in my opinion, are going to have to go to nine, ten, dollars $11,000 a ton. Uh, that is sort of a 50% uptick from here in order to incentivize new investment in incremental capacity. And what is what does that imply in terms of dollar terms? Well, the, the capital intensity of a new annual ton of, of metal is about $10,000 a ton. So if you say that the, the incremental demand from EVs, which don't, doesn't really exist at the moment, but will become increasingly so in the future, is 4 million tons by 2030, 4 million tons times $10,000 a ton implies that the industry is going to have to invest Forty billion dollars of incremental capital to generate these additional tons that are needed to satisfy demand from just one source that is a new source electric vehicles, uh, leaving aside um, the amount of capital that the industry is going to have to expend to maintain the current mine supply of of 23 million tons a year as grades continue to decline. So um, I, I'm fairly confident, um, uh, I may have it wrong, but I'm fairly confident that um, copper is going to be a good place to be um, for the foreseeable future um, because of this structural deficit and the incremental demand um, that will be imposed on the system by electric vehicles. So.
um, how how can listeners um, benefit from rising copper prices? Well, for for those of your listeners that prefer sort of the more liquid um, large cap names, um, one of my favorites is First Quantum. The ticker is FM. The market cap is um, something on the order of 13 billion Canadian dollars. First Quantum is almost a pure copper play. It is a very significant producer and aggressive developer of new copper uh, supply and uh, no doubt will be a beneficiary of further upticks in copper price. I I know, um, Colin, that some of your investors have a higher appetite for risk and prefer to play um, smaller cap names. I have two uh, both of which I own, by the way, to recommend. The, the first is um, an interesting company on the Toronto Stock Exchange called Nevada Copper Corp. The ticker is NCU. The market cap is on the order of 65 or 70 million Canadian dollars. Um, this company is interesting in my view because they have the largest uh, fully permitted um, undeveloped copper project in North America happens to be in Nevada, and they just recently announced a recapitalization and project financing that will put it in production with First Copper expected in 2019. So as copper price continues to strengthen, um, there's no doubt that this this share share price will benefit, uh, particularly as it's a near-term producer with first production coming on in the next 18 months. Um, For those of your listeners that um, prefer even sort of higher risk reward um, and and like to play more with the micro caps, um, I have one name which I happen to own. It's called Gold Reach Resources. The the name is a bit of a misnomer because it's really a copper company. The ticker is GRV. It trades on the TSX Venture Exchange. It has a meaningless market cap at the moment at uh, 11 million or 10 million Canadian dollars, but it has the distinction of owning a rather uh, significantly sized um, advanced copper project in British Columbia, open pit, good grade, and uh, in my in my opinion, is 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 massively mispriced, and I think um, sooner or later, um, um, copper those interested in in adding copper exposure will will come across it, and it'll get rapidly re-rated, and it will certainly um, benefit as copper prices increase. So that's sort of my my copper. Um, story and and those are my copper thoughts. I I think it's a pretty safe place to park capital for the foreseeable future because copper is um, it's not getting any cheaper to either find or dig out of the ground and one thing is um, crystal clear and that is that um, the world's going to need a lot more of this metal not just for electric vehicles but for just um, uh, grid build out and for um, washing machines and refrigerators and everything else as as the world increasingly moves um, into um, a middle-class lifestyle. Well, Mike, you certainly make my job quite easy being the interviewer. You just got through all of the points without any guidance needed. I guess uh, to add to that from a question perspective is we're talking about somewhere between a 15 to 25 percent increase in the copper demand from EVs. And when you look at something like cobalt and lithium that we've already discussed, that percentage gain pales in comparison. Obviously, the market is much, much bigger. I guess, historically, is this type of demand increase in such a big market like copper unprecedented, in your opinion? It is unprecedented, at least in the last um, 50 years. And because this um, incremental demand from electric vehicles is over and above um, the the base load year-to-year growth in copper demand. Copper um, demand is pretty closely linked um, historically to GDP growth. 
So we have the world that's at the moment growing at something on the order of 3% a year on year. So that's already a massive amount of uh, incremental copper that has to be delivered off of a base load of 23 million tons a year of mine supply. And now you're layering on top of that over the next 12 years, another 15 to 20%. And, and that's, um, that's a huge unprecedented challenge for the copper mining industry particularly because of, of grade decline. And if you look at the world's um, largest um, copper producer, which is Chile, which accounts for about a third of the world's supply, and you look at the average grade um, of the open pit porphyry mines that have been mined, um, uh, let's say, 15 years ago, uh, the average grade was um, probably something on the order of 1.4, 1.5%. And uh, today, the average grade is probably something like 0.8 or 0.75%. So grades have almost halved, which means that effectively, just to maintain current production, you have to dig twice the tons, process twice the tons through the mill. And um, and that's just to... um, to, um, to to run standing still. And now you layer on all of this incremental demand, not only from just robust world economic growth, but now this this exceptional demand, which um, is new and unprecedented. And it all points to one thing, which is massive new supply is required over the next decade. And that is not going to happen without massive capital investment, um, and I, 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 at $10,000 a ton, that's a capital intensity figure for new copper capacity. And that's only going to be made by industry if we see uh, much higher prices. So, and, and nobody's going to invest in these, particularly these, these massive open pits, now increasingly low-grade deposits, um, unless there's a significantly higher copper price than we see today. Um, $7,000 a ton is not enough to undertake a, a four, five, six billion dollar, uh, new open pit development project that might deliver 200, 250,000 tons a year of incremental supply. The world's going to need sort of 20 of those or $40 billion of incremental capital. Bigger, you know, the copper market volumetrically is a hundred times the size of the lithium market and um, 200 times the size of the cobalt market. So it takes a lot more to move the needle. But um, I think as the numbers we've talked about today demonstrate that the demand from electric vehicles for for new copper supply um, are moving the needle or will move the needle notwithstanding the the massive um, denominator, in this case, of 23 million tons a year of current supply. Excellent. Well, Mike, thank you so much for coming back on the program. This concludes our four-part series on the battery metals, and we're all hoping for a very fruitful year invested in these metals as 2018 unfolds. Colin, thank you. It's been a pleasure, and look forward to uh, catching up in the not-too-distant future. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bit. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, It could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?